Hi, uh, this is Danielle Karapkin uh, speaking to you from Thornhill, Ontario on behalf of webyeshiva.org. We are studying a Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed, Rambam's More Nevuchim, um, and we are in section three. We're in the middle of a lengthy chapter, chapter 41, which I hope to conclude today. Um, it is uh, in the course of the Rambam's explanation of Ta'amei HaMitzvot, the reason for the various mitzvot that God gave to us, um, ultimately to perfect us by allowing us to become intellectually as connected to God as possible through the perfection of that intellect. Now, in the course of chapter 41, let me just share with you my screen so that you can see uh, where we're up to. And as I mention every week, these handouts are uh, help me to present the contents of the chapter, but I think they're also helpful. So if you'd like to download them, you can find them either in the Facebook group, Shir in Morena Vuchim, or you can find them on webyeshiva.org in the course description for today's course. So um, we learned in part one of this chapter that the Rambam believes that all punishments assigned by the Torah Whenever the Torah designates a punishment for a sin, the reason for the punishment is to disincentivize the potential simmer, sinner from committing the crime, either the same person preventing him from doing it again, or for all onlookers or potential sinners to, when they see that this is the penalty, they will be disincentivized. The Rambam also taught us that there are four criteria employed to determine the severity of the punishment. That's a typo. Number one, severity of the crime. Like, is it really a very bad thing in God's eyes? How bad is it in God's eyes? Let's say, for example, murder is worse than certain sexual crimes. Number two, prevalence of the crime. How common is it? How easy or accessible? Uh, well, that's, that's uh, the, the prevalence is how much is it being committed throughout society? Number three, temptation to commit the crime. How strong is the temptation? which therefore it needs to be disincentivized further if it's something that is really weighing heavily on a person. And number four, the ease of the commission of a crime. How easy is it to be able to access this crime? So for example, we saw in our discussion from last week that the penalty for stealing an, an ox is worse than the penalty for stealing a sheep because oxen are more uh, easy to steal than sheep are. All or some of these criteria determine whether someone receives the lighter or heavier punishments whose levels are, as we saw in our discussion from last week, number one, the highest level is the death penalty. The second highest level is karate, spiritual cutting off, which translates into lashes uh, by the Beit Din. Um, the third level of severity is just the lashes without the karate. And the fourth level is no physical punishment at all when a person has committed a crime where uh, either through passivity or other minor offenses that the Torah deems not to be uh, uh, liable for any penalty at all. The Rambam continues his discussion of the wisdom in the Torah's penal system and then discusses other penal laws contained in Sefer Shoftim of Mishnah Torah. So this, just for, to, for us to remind ourselves, Chapter 41 uh, is dedicated to the sixth class out of 14 of the categories of mitzvot. And this category are those punishments which are prescribed by the Torah, which the Rambam had detailed in Sefer Shoftim of Mishnah Torah, the book of Judges of Mishnah Torah. Now he claims, the Rambam, that everything that is contained in that book, Sefer Shoftim in the Mishnah Torah, is covered in this chapter. There is curiously one thing that the Rambam will not cover in this chapter that is contained in Sefer Shoftim, which is Hilchot Evel, the laws of mourning. Uh, when a person loses a loved one, they have to uh, they have to sit shiva, and all of the other laws of mourning are, for some curious reason, contained in the in Sefer Shoftim. But because that does not have to do with punishments per se, there is no reason for the Rambam to incorporate that in this particular chapter. So let's just bear in mind that one of the questions that is lingering among the commentaries to the Mishnah Torah is why the laws of mourning, even though the Rambam spells it out, he says there are so many executions that are carried out 
in the course of this discussion in Sefer Shoftim, and sometimes mourning is appropriate and sometimes it's not for a convicted criminal who was put to death. And therefore, by extension, the Rambam includes the laws of Avelut, the laws of mourning in this book, but that's not the topic of discussion in this chapter. Let us continue because it's, there's quite a lot of material for us to cover. The establishment of lower courts throughout the land is something the Rambam says that is necessary in order to properly carry through with this disincentivization program that the punishments of the Torah are meant to provide. This is necessary in order to properly deter the local citizenry from sin. If there were only a central court and there was no local police force and no local court system, then people would not be duly disincentivized. Including in this is having a forum for accepting witness testimony on the local level. It is also necessary that there be a ruler in the land who is feared by his subjects and who will fortify the authority of the judiciary. Now this, of course, um, you know, we can certainly speak to the, uh, the dysfunction that is occurring in Western civilization today, where there is this breakdown in the authority of the executive branch, and there is not any kind of real fear that people have of the commission of crimes, certainly less than what used to exist. And certainly one should look at this chapter as a cautionary tale about what can go wrong and what has gone wrong in modern society. Let's go on to the next point. Uh, up until this point, the Rambam says, we have to this point provided a general explanation of all the laws contained in Sefer Shoftim. We must now embark on explaining some specific laws in more detail. And just remember that the focus of this chapter is to explain how the system of punishment is meant to deter future sin. Okay, so <clears throat> everything that the Rambam is going to write, even when he discusses the specific examples of halachot that are contained in Sefer Shoftim, all fit within that rubric. So the, the, the first specific mitzvah that the Rambam says is discussed in Sefer Shoftim is the law of the Zakain Mamre, known as the rebellious elder. And that's codified in Hilchot Mamrim, part of Sefer Shoftim. Now, as an introduction, recall the Rambam's words in chapter 34. Unlike medical regimens, the Torah's spiritual regimen of mitzvot cannot be particularized or tailored to the individual. On the contrary, government, governance of the law ought to be absolute and universal to include everyone, even if it is suitable only for certain individuals and not suitable for others. For if it were made to fit individuals, the whole would be corrupted and you would be natata devarecha lashi urina, a term by, used by the Talmud, that you would make out of it something that varies. In other words, there has to be a standardized law that is inclusive of everyone and applies to everyone, even if certain laws apply or more aptly to certain individuals than to others. For this, re for this reason, matters that are primarily intended in the law ought not to be dependent upon time or place, and rather the decrees must be absolute and universal according to what he may he be exalted says, as for the congregation, there shall be one statute for all of you. So uh, with this in mind, the Rambam says that standardization of law is paramount to the preservation of the national identity and the cohesion of the Jewish people. The Torah, therefore, is, comes down very hard on anyone who would disrupt that sense of national cohesion. God was aware that with the passage of time and the change of place, certain mitzvot would need to be altered somewhat because of changed circumstances. However, making dramatic changes would end up corrupting the Torah and fostering a belief that the mitzvot did not come from God because we could cavalierly uh, dispense with them or alter them at whim. As such, he forbade making those changes in general. The Torah therefore says in Deuteronomy 13, lo tosef alav velo tigra mimenu. There's a prohibition of adding to the mitzvot and subtracting from the mitzvot, meaning that if a person comes along and says, God commanded us to do one additional mitzvah, or God commanded us to put a fifth fringe on the corner of our garment instead of just four, so then that person would be in violation of this law. Now that notwithstanding, 
God allowed for the wise men of every generation, that is the high Beit Din, or what we call the Sanhedrin, to create a safeguard that would uphold the mitzvot through their innovation of additional laws. And the proviso, of course, is that these additional laws are not midioraita, they're not coming from God, but rather they are coming from the rabbis, and that these additional laws would repair any breaches, and that these new safeguards would be permanent additions to the law as clearly identified as rabbinic law. Our sages thus tell us, va'asu siyag la Torah, make a fence or some kind of protective barrier around the Torah. Permission was also granted to the court to annul at times certain positive commandments and even to permit certain prohibitions in very limited circumstances and only on a temporary basis. Now we have to be very careful and the Rambam takes proper caution in, in teaching this law, sometimes the rabbis will suspend the law. For example, they tell us when Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, do not blow the shofar. That's a suspension of a biblical law because the Torah commands us to blow the shofar on Shabbat. And yet, in limited circumstances, the rabbis can tell us, don't do a certain mitzvah. In even more limited circumstances, the rabbis have the ability to completely tell us even to violate a law if they deem it to be something that is for the greater good. And the Rambam, in his Mishnah commentary, um, talks about this. He says, in, in his introduction to the Mishnah, he talks about this concept called Hora'at Sha'a, on the idea of making a temporary uh, injunction or l new law that, that upends Torah law. And he's talking about here a prophet, but the principle also applies to the Sanhedrin. If a prophet comes along and says, no longer do a particular mitzvah, uh, or he says to violate a particular mitzvah, as Elijah did, for example, in the book of Kings, when he told the Jewish people to build an altar on Mount Carmel, when it was prohibited to build altars outside of the temple, if it is clear that he is coming with the authority of a prophet of God, or if, it is, if the Sanhedrin is coming with the authority that is vested within them by God, as the Sanhedrin, and it's only on a temporary basis, um, then it is permitted for them to do so. However, limiting the ability to make changes in this way, the law remains one and remains consistent over time, so that there's never the opportunity given to permanently suspend or, or violate a law. It can only be done in very limited circumstances, and we can probably count on one or at most two hands the number of times this has been done in Jewish history. This is the reason why God only allows the high Beitin to make changes and forbids any individual wise man from doing this on his own, even if he has all of the qualifications of a member of the Sanhedrin. Any person who takes the initiative to make changes on his own is put to death. If individuals were permitted to do so, the intended purpose of the system, which would be to create this cohesion of a national religion would be destroyed. In the words of the sages, We don't want every individual building his own private altar and worshiping God in his own way. And that's the reason why this law was designed in such a way, such that if a person is a Zakein Mamre and he goes ahead and he rebels against the Sanhedrin, that person is put to death. That's the law of the rebellious elder. And there are many details to this law, which we're not going to go have a chance to go into today, but it is important at least to recognize that this, again, speaks to deterrence. In order to deter any qualified rabbinic uh, figure from dissenting and trying to get uh, a segment of his compatriots to, uh, to alter the law in any way that is not uh, 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 assented to by the majority of the Sanhedrin, that person has to be put to death. And remember, the Rambam had said, the death penalty is reserved for those people who are, are really pose the greatest uh, danger to uh, destroying the religious system. Remember those four criteria as far as how high the punishment has to be. This, the punishment is so high as far as being the death penalty for the Zakein Mamre, the rebellious elder, because he stands to do the most damage, to wreak the most havoc to the religious system in Israel.
Okay, number, the next point in our outline is regarding intent, there are four levels of sinner. And now here the Rambam takes a little bit of an interlude. Um, he said he was going to discuss individual mitzvot that are contained in the book of Shoftim, but first he wants to point out to us that there are four different levels of sinner. And the reason why this is re relevant to the Zakein Mamre, to the rebellious elder, will be apparent in just a moment. So we, many of us know that there are three levels of intent. There's what's called anus, which is completely compelled or accidental, where a person is not liable for that action. There's like, for, for example, a person puts a gun to your head. Um, yeah, it's the book of Shoftim, not the Parsha of Shoftim. Parsha, it's Parshat Shoftim, very different from the book of Shoftim. Um, so an anus is a completely accidental sinner. A person puts a gun to my head and forces me to eat something non-kosher. I'm called an anus. I'm not liable. A shogeg is an inadvertent transgressor, which we'll explain in just a second. There's some level of culpability. A mazid is a deliberate transgressor, a person who eats the chazer, eats the pig because of a moral weakness. And finally, there's osabiyad rama which literally means acting high-handedly or with an intent to rebel against God. This is not codified all in one place in Sefer Shoftim. We therefore refer you to Hilchot Shegagot and Hilchot Shuvah chapter 3 to discuss this concept of Osebi Adrama, uh, acting with rebellious intent. So these four levels are something that the Ram is going to address right now. The Anus is, that, is a person who's completely coerced or is not is is does the sin completely without any premeditation or any way that he could have prevented the sin, and therefore the Torah says that person is held completely blameless. The shogeg is partially guilty guilty in that he should have been more careful. The classic example is the accidental killer, but he's working on the rooftop and he's using a trowel and he lets the trowel slip out of his hands and it falls down and hits someone on the ground and kills them, there is some level of, it. yes, it's true, it's not, it was completely unintentional, not premeditated, but he should have taken certain precautions that he failed to do, and therefore he must go to a city of refuge. He's not punished, but he must, in other sins, bring sacrificial atonement. Regarding his sacrifice, the Torah distinguishes between whether the offender is a regular civilian, a king, a Kohen Gadol, or a judge who rules law for the entire community. So what we infer from this is that anyone who rules for the community without being a Kohen Gadol or on behalf of the high court is acting deliberately, even if he ruled incorrectly, unintentionally. In other words, the Torah allows for a sacrifice to be offered by a judge who makes a mistake. But if a person has the chutzpah to go ahead and say, I'm going to rule on this law, even though I am not recognized as a respected elder who has been elected to the Sanhedrin. Then such a person is derelict in his, in his duty to be, to be scholarly enough to be able to paskin on a particular halacha. And that's why a Zakein Mamre is put to death, either if he acts upon his own ruling or causes others to do the same. And this is something that the Rambam says in Hilchot Mamrim chapter 3. By contrast, if the Sanhedrin, in other words, why is it, why is that so? Because even though he may possess the proper scholarship, but he is not acting in his formal capacity as ruling on behalf of the Sanhedrin. When the Sanhedrin makes a mistake, God says, okay, it was an innocent mistake. You erred in your ruling of the law. You caused Jews to commit a crime based on your ruling, and therefore you can bring a sacrifice to atone, and I will forgive you, says God. But a Zakein Mamre who acts and says, listen, I erred in my ruling, but you didn't have the sanction of the Sanhedrin to dispense with that ruling. And therefore the Torah says, regardless of whether you were correct or incorrect in your ruling, the fact that you dissented from the Sanhedrin and you without authorization went ahead and instructed your fellow Jews to do something means that you must be put to death because you are therefore uh, like a mazid. You're like an intentional sinner. And that's really the point of the Rambam introducing us to these four levels at this particular juncture. By contrast, if the Sanhedrin errs in their ruling, they are considered by scripture as shogeg, as the unintentional sinner, and they, they thus bring a special offering of atonement. We are very strict for all others who err in their ruling, 
consistent with the teaching of Rabbi Yehuda in Pirkei Avot, Hevi Zahir B'Talmud, Shishigigat Talmud Ole Zadon. That any time, if you're not careful with your learning and you dispense rulings based on certain, based on sloppy scholarship or negligent scholarship, then that's tantamount to committing a sin intentionally because you have to take great care before you are prepared to dispense any ruling. And then the Rambam writes, uh, really consistent with this idea, that there are two types of unintentional sinner. One who is unaware that what he is eating is forbidden fat. He thinks that it's kosher, but it, in reality it's not. Versus one who knows that what he is eating is forbidden fat. He knows that he's eating intestinal fat, but he is unaware that intestinal fat is forbidden. That's a type of negligence that is born out of ignorance. And a person doesn't always have the excuse of ignorance to excuse a sinful act. And that is the reason why a Zakein Mamre, who has ruled erroneously, is dealt with harshly despite his lack of intent to violate the law. Now, the third, now that the Rambam has, so this is the connection in this discussion to the Zakein Mamre, but now that the Rambam has brought these four levels of intent to describe how the penalty will differ based on level of intent, the Rambam is going to carry through with this. Let's let's look at the third level of intent, which is mazed. I know that what I know that this is a ham sandwich in front of me. I know that it's something that I want to eat. I know that the Torah forbids it. I'm going to eat it anyway because I have this tremendous craving for ham, and I'm not able to suppress my temptation. Such a person will be punished by the courts as prescribed by Scripture. He will either get the death penalty let's say if he commits adultery, for example, or he will get malkut if he eats that ham sandwich, or in a case where the Torah does not prescribe a courtly punishment, the court, the rabbinic court, has the discretion to administer what's called makat mardut, flogging by rabbinic ordinance. And finally, sometimes the payment is a fine if what I do causes damage to others or I, I end up stealing from others. Based, again, I do it bemazed, I do it intentionally with... Uh, the intent to commit a sin, but simply due to my weakness of moral fiber or constitution. There are a few select select laws where the Torah treats a mazid like a shogate, that they treat the intentional sinner as if he did it unintentionally, either because the transgression occurs often or with ease. So if there's a particular sin that is very, very easy to commit, God basically goes easy on the offender knowing how easy, just with the slip of a tongue, for example, it was to commit this sin. And therefore, God says, you know what? It was something that, you know, even though you knew what you were doing, but it was such an easy sin to commit, I will sometimes consider that to be like a shogig, and therefore I will allow you to atone with a sacrifice instead of administering a harsher punishment. And this is true when a person swears falsely. Um, for example, if he swears, I don't know testimony about a certain case, and when in reality he does, or when a person swears falsely that he doesn't have something in someone else, in his possession that belongs to someone else, when in reality he does. These are considered to be slips of the tongue where a person through perhaps um, a desire to steal or a desire to not get involved and be a good uh, Samaritan, as if you'll allow the uh, the analogy. These are things that God says, well, these were done by utterances of the lips. I will allow you to atone as if you did this unintentionally. Another example the Rambam says is the case of the Shifcha Harufa. Without going into too much detail, this is a woman who is a, a, a partially a maidservant, partially a free, a, a free Jew, and she has sort of like this in-between nishtahin nishtaher, as they say in Yiddish, where she's in limbo, and as such, she really is not allowed to be with any man. Her master goes ahead, and because the Rambam's thesis is, the Torah allows a man who sleeps with her to atone for this intentional sin uh, by, by through, through a sacrificial offering, and he treats this person as if he committed a sin bishogeg. 
and there's two reasons for it. Number one, she's not completely betrothed because only a portion of her is considered to be liberated, and sub uh, uh, and or, or 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 and the other part is considered to be still enslaved and subject to betrothal, and therefore it's not a complete betrothal. And number two, the presumption that the Rambam makes about this woman is that she's given herself away, sort of like to attach herself to any man. We assume she's probably going to seduce the man because she realizes that she can't be with any man. And again, for various reasons, the Torah looks at this as less of a mazid than in other cases because of the, the, the temptation being so great. Number four, the, the highest level of intent is the Osebi Adrama, acting high-handedly with the intent to rebel against God. He acts with impudence and audacity and seeks to flaunt his sin publicly. He does not sin because he's succumbing to his vices, like the guy who just has this weakness for ham sandwiches, but rather in order to oppose and combat the Torah. He doesn't believe in the Torah, he doesn't believe in God, and he therefore wishes to publicly flaunt this fact and to gain popularity and other adherence to his ideology. He must be killed based on his reviling about of God. About him it says, et Hashem hu megadef, he is degrading or blaspheming God, and therefore he must be cut off from his people. Because he's committing the sin out of ideological motivations, the rabbis understood that the specific sin he's committing in this verse is idolatry, since this is the antithesis of fealty to God in the Torah. And if we look in the Mishnah Torah, we will note that the Rambam only gives the death penalty for a person who acts biyad ramah when he is involved in an idolatrous kind of ritual or statement or public declaration, that's where he gets put to death. However, the Rambam in the, in the Mora Nevuchim has a completely different approach from the legal approach that he takes in the Mishnah Torah. He says, in my opinion, a person deserves death for any sin committed biyad ramah, meaning that he does so out of an ideology that rejects the truth of God's Torah. So, for example, a person gets up in the middle of Kiddush at Shul after Shabbos, and he says, Chevra, I want to have an announcement to make. You see this ham sandwich that I am holding in my hand. I don't even like ham, but I feel that it is ridiculous to follow these arcane and archaic laws of the Torah, and therefore I'm about to take a bite out of my sandwich. He takes a bite in front of everyone. He is not doing this because... He, is, he has a weakness for Ham. He is not doing this because he wishes he has this overpowering urge to commit the sin. He may not even want to commit the sin for personal purposes, but he wishes to flaunt his ideology. And therefore the Rambam says that even eating a ham sandwich, really this person should be put to death over. This would include a person who eats milk and meat, wears shotness or cuts the corners of his head. This is not because this is the proper punishment for this crime, but rather because such a person will lead others astray. And in order to deter others from following his example, we need to come down upon him with the ultimate penalty. And again, as I point out in my parentheses, just as, as an aside, you'll note that the Rambam in Mishnah Torah does not codify this in the same way. From a halachic standpoint, we can only put to death those people that the Talmud says get the death penalty and the 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 actor Biyad Rama, who sins with with this um, uh, with this intent to rebel against God, is only within the context of idolatry. But the Rambam says thematically, when I look at this mitzvah as it's contained in the Torah, anyone, whatever act that he does, even if it's not idolatry related, should be put to death for flagrantly violating the law for ideological reasons. This law is therefore no different from that of the Ir Hanidachat where an entire city is killed and its contents raised to the ground, as is discussed in Deuteronomy chapter 13. In that situation, even though there are many innocents within the city, there are men, women, and children, yet the Torah prescribes the ultimate penalty as, again, remember, the whole theme of this chapter is punishments were designed for deterral and disincentive, and so to destroy an entire community and burn all of its contents to the ground is to deter anyone from trying to take up that similar practice. I maintain, says the Rambam, that the same should be done to any community who conspire to violate any sin 
not just idolatry and to commit it flagrantly. We can derive this, he says, from a story in the book of Joshua, where the tribes of Gad and Reuven, who were living in the Transjordan, were accused of having built an illegal altar, as is recorded in Joshua chapter 22. The entire nation was about to go to war against the tribes of Gad and Reuven and were prepared to put them to death. It was because the nation believed that they had ideologically rejected the Torah, even though it was through the violation of a solitary mitzvah. The, uh, the accusation to the Gadites and the Reuvenites was not that you're committing idolatry, but that you're not allowed to have an altar outside of the temple in Jerusalem or, or in the Mishkan at that time in the city of Shiloh. Why then are you having a private altar on the other side of the Jordan? What you're doing is insurrective, and even though it's not idolatry because you still worship the same God, you deserve to be put to death. The Gadites and the Reubenites responded that they had not at all meant this as an act of rebellion. They explained that it wasn't meant as a functional altar, but rather as a reminder of their fealty to the God of Israel, and therefore they were spared. But the Rambam's point is, we should thus apply this principle to punishments in general contained in the Torah. So the, the point that the Rambam is making in this long discussion of the highest level of, of sinner, which is not just the mazed, the person who does the sin intentionally, but, rather, but because of a weakness of character, but rather a person who sins for ideological reasons, biyad rama, is again consistent with the whole theme of this, of this portion, which is all about de- creating punishments which will sufficiently deter a repeat of this offense. Now, let's go on to the specific mitzvot that are contained in the book of Shoftim, the commandment to destroy Amalek and other wholesale national punishments. The Torah says, wipe out the entire people of Amalek. That's a lesson in deterrence also. Let the other tribes of the world, let the other nations of the world, see how harshly Amalek is treated so that they know not to harass the Jews. Um, We're not going to get into modern commentary and to discuss what is going on in the Middle East today, but I would like you to think about the idea that the state of Israel knows today that if we do not come down hard and destroy Hamas entirely, then the world will not be duly disincentivized to do this again against the Jews. Now, um, not to compare what's going on in Israel to wiping out Amalek, because there is that would be uh, called genocide, and that's not what Israel is doing. They are taking painstaking efforts to spare women and children, despite Hamas's best efforts to include women and children in the carnage. But the point being is that the greater the threat to the Jewish people, the greater the punishment needs to be to disincentivize others from posing that threat to the Jewish people. Now, through this commandment, even if an evil and corrupt person would arise, he would be unable to enlist his fellow tribesmen to rise against the Jew, knowing what punishment awaits them. Amalek is to be killed by the sword because they attacked with the sword. By contrast, we have other nations where the Torah says we have to distance ourselves from them, reject them, Ammon and Moab. The Torah says, Lo yavo Ammoni u'mo'avi bikal Hashem, that an Ammonite and a Moabite may not enter into the congregation of God, which means not that they don't have a right to convert, but even when they do convert, they cannot marry um, Jews and Jewesses uh, from the Jewish people because, uh, and the Rambam says even further than that, they are disdained and their friendship shunned, which is not really explicit in the text, but the Rambam says this, that that's thematically what the Torah wants us to do, to push them away. Now, why are we supposed to push them away? Because they treated us improperly. Now, um, they didn't attack us by the sword, but they did things that through plots and deception. The Moabites hired Bilam in order to curse the Jews. The Ammonites refused to provide us with bread and water when we were traveling through the desert, even though we were cousins, even though they, the, Ammon and Moab um, were, were Lot's sons, uh, and Lot is Avraham's nephew, so these are our cousins. And they were cruel to us. They didn't want to have anything to do with us. So we distance ourselves from them. We don't kill them because they didn't try to kill us, but they try to do things that would be harmful to us. Next, for specific commandments. And again, this, this is, again, the theme of disincentive. The commandment to dig latrines with shovels. 
the Rambam says this also involves disincentive, as we'll see in just a, a moment. The Torah sa- states that when a military camp encamps out, let's say, in the wilderness to prepare to attack the enemy, they must have a, uh, a, a system whereby people who need to relieve themselves go outside the encampment and then dig up a hole in the ground with which they can bury the human, uh, the human excrement. Now, one reason for this mitzvah, of course, has got nothing to do with this incentive, but rather it's because cleanliness is next to godliness and that man must distinguish himself from the beasts of the wild. But the deterrence aspect of this, of this mitzvah is that it reminds the Jewish army that the Shekhinah rests among the Jews, thus reminding us that we cannot behave like our enemies do, especially during times of war. Now, this is a beautiful ethical precept, and I've seen this in practice. I, I remember meeting a chayal who showed me his little, a little shovel that was issued to him by the Israeli army so that in the event that he needs to dig a latrine, he will have the opportunity to do so. And so it's a beautiful reminder that biblical law is still, in, in certain ways, is still alive. Included in this reminder is the law to the army camp that if a person has had a seminal emission, he must leave the camp until sunset. The Rambam notes that this is the simple import of the scripture, even though the rabbis interpret it not having to do with a military encampment, but nonetheless, it's in the context of that text, referring to a military encampment, a soldier who has a seminal emission has to go outside of the camp until he purifies himself. All these remind us that our function as a Jewish army is unlike that of the Gentiles, who destroy and do wrong and harm the others and rob them of their property. On the contrary, our purpose is to make people apt to obey God and to introduce order into their lives. And as a result, it is the responsibility of a Jewish army to behave with a higher standard of cleanliness and purity than the uh, non-Jewish army camp. Um, And next is, and with this we'll finish, the law of the Eshet Yifat Toar, the beautiful woman found among the captured, which is discussed in Deuteronomy chapter 21, Parshat Ki where the Torah says that under certain circumstances, if a Jewish soldier um, uh, takes captives uh, after winning a battle successfully, and one one of those captives happens to be a beautiful uh, Gentile woman, there are certain ways that the Torah allows this person to actually cohabit with this woman. And the reason why is because lo dibra Torah ele keneged yetzer hara. The Torah speaks to man's evil inclination. This is a way of indulging man's overpowering evil inclination during times of war. It thus contains a deterrence, a deterrence aspect of deterring a man whose sexual appetite is out of control due to the violence and the excitement of war, curtailing it as much as possible and trying to get him away from his sexual indulgence. As we'll see in a moment, the Torah actually creates disincentives for, from, uh, from, uh, for, f- to, to prevent this man from fully consummating his lust for this woman. And we tell, we tell the man, you are allowed to consummate the relationship only once, then you must let this woman mourn for her family, remove all of her beautiful dress and attire and adornments, and you have to leave her alone. And you cannot touch her after that one time consummation that we permitted as a concession to your evil inclination. It contains a regimen of how to control one's behavior towards piety. That is, even though a man has an overpowering urge for her, he must seclude her in privacy after that one time. Further, he may not be intimate with her until the war is over and until her crying and mourning cease. He must allow her to be in her disheveled state of mourning. For those who grieve find solace in crying as this allows their energy for grief to dissipate. Just as the Torah allowed him to be intimate with her that one time while she was still a non-Jew, she is permitted to persist in her pagan beliefs up to 30 days in captivity. If after that point, she still persists in her pagan beliefs, the man may not convert her, but he, nor may he sell her into slavery. He must treat her with respect. The Torah commands, lo tit amer ba tachat asher inita. You may not do anything to afflict her or to degrade her because you have already degraded her by betting her that one time. The Torah is sensitive to treating her respectfully 
to compensate for the fact that the man exposed her nakedness previously. The mitzvah thus engenders noble moral quality, and as the Rambam concludes this chapter, the reasons for all the commandments contained in the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges, have accordingly become clear. And that's the way he really ends the chapter, by basically saying, I've given you a whole unit on showing you how many of the mitzvot in the Torah were designed to deter sinners from committing serious crimes that could potentially damage not only individuals, but the entire fabric of Jewish society. And that would, of course, um, destroy the entire project of why God gave us the Torah in the first place, which is to allow us to become as close to Hashem as possible. So that really is, uh, that, that concludes the chapter. Let me, um, let me close my, um, my shared document. Are there any questions or comments at this point? We have a, a, a minute or two where we can take a question or two if anyone would like to speak. And my, again, my apologies. Sometimes I don't always hear when someone is speaking. So if I don't respond to you, uh, just put it in the just put it in the chat. Okay. All right. Uh, if that being the case, let me wish you all a wonderful week. I hope to see you next week, where we will begin. Uh, do, hopefully, do all of chapter forty-two, and uh, we'll see you then next time. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Rabbi.